All righty, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you again for being here. And happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And I truly mean that we count each and every one of you amongst our blessings. A beautiful, a beautiful celebration of God's love and God's life. Just the way we see everyone, the way we experience everyone. Today we're going to talk about gratitude, and we, we do usually around Thanksgiving. And, we, and, of course, each year is a different year because we're different people. And each year something different comes through. Just my, uh, my prayer, my treatment in preparation is just <clears throat> to be the vehicle through which the Spirit, love, the divine, can express what ought to be expressed today and to bring to bring to the, the conference bridge and the channel and, and all those things to bring to the avenues of communication those for whom this message is right at this time and I think that's why it's always different it's always different because we're always different people you can never step into the same stream twice not only has the stream changed, but we've changed. So we want to look at this idea of, of gratitude, perhaps in a different way than we ever had before. And if you've seen the email, I spelled it uh, differently. I spelled it capital G, capital R, hyphen, attitude. Attitude. And I think that kind of, it, it does a couple things. Of course, when you use words... Uh, differently than they're normally used, it it stops and makes people think. Well, what do they mean by that? You know? And this is one of the things when you first come in in the science of mind teaching, where people say, "Why do you what do you say treatment instead of prayer? Is it that prayer?" Well, it's not. It's different. But using the word treatment requires people to stop and ask themselves, "Well, how is it different? What is meant by that?" So gratitude, as most of us were taught as we as we grew up and as our as the adults in our life were teaching us manners gratitude seemed to be something that we we express in response to something that someone else has done for us and and i remember you know i Probably one of the, <clears throat> the strongest memories that comes to me is uh, taking the kids trick-or-treating when they were little, you know. And they would ring the bell and they would hold out their little bags and say trick-or-treat, which now that I look back at it, we're basically teaching our kids how to do blackmail. <laughs> but nevertheless, they hold out their little bags and <clears throat> people would come to the door. Oh, you know, what, what are you? What, what are you dressed up as? And then they would put candy in the bags. <clears throat> And mommy and daddy would say to the kids, well, now, what do you say? What do you say? And in unison, you know, if there was a dozen kids at the door at the time where there was only one, but they would all have the same kind of pitch, the same kind of musicality. They would, say, they would kind of sing the song, thank you, and then they would, <clears throat> they would go on, you know. And I think that's, that's certainly the way that I learned gratitude as a child growing up and I think that's the way a lot of us have learned gratitude. Gratitude is something that we do and it's almost like the conclusion of a transaction. You know, it's it's kind of like uh, kind of like when you leave the grocery store and they say have a nice day you know that means you're done next we're moving on have a nice day. So this idea of thank you is, is it brings to closure some sort of a transaction. We've asked something, somebody gave us something, and now we're saying thank you. We're expressing our gratitude. And that's not the gratitude that I'm talking about today. That might be, that might be good manners. That might be being polite. You know, That might be something that is socially required of us and socially acceptable to us, but it's not gratitude. It is not gratitude in the spiritual sense of what gratitude is. And there's a couple of things that we want to, we want to point out. We're going to get into, well, what is, what is gratitude? 
Remember, the last few weeks, we've, what we've been talking about is getting, getting beyond or away from the intellect, away from ideas of right and wrong, beyond ideas of right and wrong, getting to that field where Rumi said he would meet us. Because God is not an intellectual exercise. God is not a mathematical problem to be solved. You, know, you, you can add up 2 plus 2 and you'll get 4 every time. Or where I went to school most of the time. <laughs> That's a mathematical problem to be solved. We get to it through a process of logic and reason. We get to it through a procedure of arithmetic that we have been we have been taught as children and once we learn that of course we can apply that to other sets of numbers other combinations of numbers but there's nothing that we can add together to to come to ah oh, well that's god see ah oh, there's god right there We have to understand the, the role that our intellect plays, the role that logic and reason play in our spiritual development. But we have to also come to accept the limitations of the intellect. Now in the Eastern tradition, we have the, the um, example of walking the razor's edge, walking the razor's edge. And the spiritual path is like walking the razor's edge. It's easy, it's easy to fall off. You know? In Christianity, you might say that the road is narrow, or many are called and, and few are chosen, or it's easier to get into the kingdom of heaven than it is to get a rope through the eye of a needle. All of these things are kind of, of, kind of telling us similar ideas similar things and the problem the first problem we want to talk about is of the intellect is the intellect as as we experience it as I experience it as we, we kind of go through life the intellect likes to be right the intellect likes to analyze things it likes to weigh things it likes to touch things and it likes to make judgment calls and analysis calls you know Ah, that's the, I've, I've looked at all of these things, I've looked at all the evidence, I've read all these articles, and what that means to me is this, whatever this happens to be. And from that point on, the intellect keeps defending its decision. So any, any new data that comes along that seems to agree with the, with the foregone conclusion... Well, that gets right in. We let that right in. It becomes kind of a, see, see, I was right. Look at that. And anything that disagrees with our foregone conclusion, well, we dismiss that. That's, that must be wrong. It's, it's you know, in today's, in today's language, it's fake news. We, we don't even want to pay any attention to that. You know? So the intellect kind of uh, <clears throat> likes to weigh and analyze things, and, and it likes to put them in the box and it likes to know, and this is why I think the opening quote that uh, Wendy gave us is so appropriate, you know. If you find people who are seekers, walk with them. But if you find people who think they know, run away, run away. See? Because once the intellect literally makes up its mind, once, once the intellect decides, ah, this is it, and I know it, it's, it's done. It excludes other things, and it has... It has uh, made its bed and it's lying in it now. The intellect's creation is, is our ego. Right? The ego is a collection of ideas of who and what we are. And most of the time we use the term I, we are referring to the ego I, the intellect's understanding of who and what I am. And the ego tends to enjoy a struggle a fight. It's always prepared to fight to defend what it believes. 
not recognizing that what it believes is generated by the intellect, which may, may or may not be right. So there's a limitation to the intellect in terms of how it operates, and there's, an in, there's a limitation in terms of what it is capable of knowing. There are, there are things that we know we can't know as human beings. Sounds, sounds like an oxymoron, but we know that we can't know. So an ex the example that I've used, and I've used it before, is if we, are, if we are reading about physics and we are reading about the origins of the universe, we come, we come to the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory, as simply as I can state it, and believe me, I, I don't pretend to understand it, but in its simplest terms as I understand it, is, is at one point everything that there is was collapsed into a single point, a singularity. And then something happened, the physicists might say, something kicked the can, something happened, <clears throat> and from that point of singularity, <clears throat> there, was, <clears throat> there was this big bang. And the universe began to expand from this one single point. It began to expand. And you say, Okay, well, what was it like at the moment before the Big Bang? What was it that kicked the can? What was there before time and space existed? And the honest answer to that is, is we don't have any way of knowing because all of our ways of knowing require time and space, require being able to measure things in space, to weigh things, to touch things to identify them in the fourth dimension in time where they were when we went through these processes. So the intellect can tell us <clears throat> that there is a place that, that must be, you know, makes sense to the intellect that, that the Big Bang is there and there was something before it, but the intellect has to acknowledge that it can't possibly know what that was. It has no way of knowing. It is beyond the capability of the intellect to know. So I realize that's a little, little bit of a lengthy explanation, but what we're trying to get to is what is this thing called God? What is this thing called God? And what we come to in that same sense is we will, our intellect will come to the point where it must, it must acknowledge the ineffableness of God. There are not words to describe what this is. As Joseph Campbell tells us in some of his work, <clears throat> the word God itself is a metaphor for everything that transcends the known limitations of human consciousness. The word God is a metaphor. <clears throat> it, it is. It is that which transcends all of the known limitations of human consciousness. We understand here, our consciousness knows beginning, middle, and end. But this, this thing that God is, what God is, always was. It transcends beginning, middle, and end. <clears throat> and you and I can't relate to that. We can't comprehend that, you know. We try to think about what is, what is forever. What is what? Where was I before I was born? One of the, one of the cones in in the, the Buddhist teaching was, you know, what was your face like? Before, what what face did you have before you were born, or what did your face look like before you were born? We understand that that, <clears throat> that there's a limit to what can be known. But this thing that we call God, this experience that we call God, has no such limit. It is omniscience. And we understand that there's a limit to power. There's things that can and cannot be done, but God is all-powerful. So as we start to study, as we start to grow, we, we kind of come into this realization then that, that, that this thing that we call God is beyond intellectual capability of knowing. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means that the intellect cannot know it, cannot 
understand it. Just as the intellect cannot know what <clears throat> what was going on the moment before the Big Bang. We don't have words to describe it. So what I'm trying to get to here is what we've been talking about these last few weeks is getting beyond the limitations of the intellect and the ego, getting beyond those completely, beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, getting to that field, that, that experience of a field that Rumi is talking about, and just being in the presence of the divine. And that experience that we're talking about is probably um, best described as feeling, as a feeling. But I can't tell you what your feeling is going to be like as opposed to somebody else's. I can't tell you that everybody's feeling is the same, where we each have an individualized or unique experience. But it is something it is something that doesn't come to us by thought. It is something that doesn't come to us through logic and reason. <clears throat> it doesn't come to us through the five physical senses. But it is the experience of a feeling. So I ask you to keep this idea in mind then <clears throat> that when we're talking about experiencing the love, experiencing the presence, we are talking about our feeling nature, our feeling nature. So when we talk about gratitude as being a polite response to something somebody out there did for us in response to our request. I asked, they gave, I said thank you. Now we start to, to have to come back and think about that in terms of our relationship with God. Because the, the spiritual practice that of gratitude that we're talking about, it, it has been portrayed as a similar transaction, but it cannot be. It cannot be. It, it just can't exist that way. So in some, in some things that we read and some things that we hear, uh, the, the relationship that we have with God is portrayed almost in that, in that same light of a, of a child asking for candy and getting it. God is out there and God has all the power out there and God has all the resources out there. God has all the stuff and substance out there. We are somehow separated from God, we are apart from, we are different than, we are unworthy, and all of these other ideas of separation. And the only way that we can get what it is that we need is by somehow getting God to give it to us. This is the experience of a small child who has no resources of their own, and every time they need something, they have to go to mommy and daddy and ask. I need 25 cents for a school project. I need to buy a pen, I need an eraser, I need this, I need that, you know. And then mommy and daddy have to have to find the money and um, and give it to them. And then when when God answers the prayer, right, then there is gratitude. There is this thank you in the traditional sense of I asked, you gave, now we're closing the transaction. I'm saying thank you. And today we want to move entirely away from that. We want to we want to take that idea and say that may be appropriate if you if you're interested in being polite, but that is not the spiritual practice of gratitude. So the reason I spelled gratitude with the word attitude in it is that attitude probably more closely resembles a feeling, an orientation a point of view, and a way of looking at things, a way of feeling about things, you know. Now, we, we come to realize as, as we mature that our attitude is not dependent upon other people. You know, now, now when we're growing, when we're, when we're kind of in that stage of developing, we may think that, well, I'm in a bad mood because so-and-so said something to me. You know? And we've all had that experience. And yet when we do that, what we're saying is, I have no choice over the way I feel. Uh, I am just a, a, a simple uh, automaton. And if somebody says something to me that 
that I perceive as hurtful, well, I have no choice but to react by being in a foul mood. <clears throat> we do that. We go through life and we do that. But at some point we start to realize that that's not true. That's not true. You, know? you and I, we are the only ones who can control our attitude. We are the only ones who determine how it is how it is that we feel. And you and you know this. You know, you know some people who are in a foul mood and and it doesn't matter, you know, if if you went if if somebody was standing on a street corner handing out hundred dollar bills, saying, Here, just take this. I don't care what you do with it, just just take this hundred dollar bill, somebody would get that hundred dollars and say, There's a catch here. There's something wrong here. You're trying to trick me. You're some kind of a crook. And then their whole day would be ruined. You know, they would go off and, and you'd say, what's the matter? And they'd say, well, I don't know what's going on, but there's some trickster down there trying to, trying to get me to take $100, and, and it's just not right. And they would, it would ruin their whole day. Their whole day would be ruined. But it wasn't because somebody was trying to give them $100. It was because that is their orientation towards life. You know? Other people are happy all the time. It doesn't matter what's going on. They're happy all the time. And we, we, as we mature, we have to come to understand that we are responsible and accountable for our worldview, for our attitude towards life, for our feeling towards life. Is, life, is li <clears throat> all of life for me and none of life against me? Or is everyone and everything, including God, out to get me, you know? We have to make that determination. And for folks who are, who are really struggling with that, say, well, you're crazy. You're crazy. I can't control the way I respond. I can't control the way I feel. You have to read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. If Viktor Frankl could be in Auschwitz and, and have lost his family and be, be witness to the things he was witness to, and then realize that no one could take away his ability to be happy. We have to look at that. We have to look at that and say, well, then maybe, maybe I can. Okay. None of us, none of us here are facing what that man faced. So we can, we can, and we are in control of our worldview, of our feeling, of our outlook towards life. So. Gratitude, then, is a grateful attitude, a grateful attitude. We, we generally have the feeling that everything is good. Everything is good. Everything is wonderful. There's good everywhere. And today, I find it. You know? I think I told you this, but it just flashed into my mind. I'll share it again. Many, many... Years and years ago, when uh, Lori and I were in training for the ministry, the the, uh, the students, the ministerial students, we took turns with the Sunday school, teaching the Sunday school kids. And it was a very small congregation. We didn't always have kids. Sometimes we had none. Sometimes you had a half a dozen, you know. So you had to be prepared for for kids to show up, but they didn't always show up. So one Sunday, uh, one Sunday I was on, I was on the schedule to do the Sunday school, and this little guy showed up, and he was about four, about four years old, in there. and now he's all grown. Now he's in his twenties, and I think he's married. So it was some time ago, but he showed up, and his parents had just taken him to um, a science store in the mall. And he had a little junior explorer's kit. He had a little a pith helmet, and he had a magnifying glass, and he had a, a butterfly net, and he had a specimen jar. That that's what came in this kit, you know. So you can imagine, you can imagine me as an adult. I've got this Sunday school lesson all prepared from the curriculum, and here's this little guy, and all he wants to do is kind of look through that magnifying glass, you know. That's, that's where his energy was. That's where his curiosity was. So what we did was we went on a nature walk. He was the only kid that showed up that day. And we got his little helmet and got his little magnifying glass. And, 
and got everything in his gear and we just went out into the neighborhood and there was a few vacant lots in the neighborhood there was you know there was weeds and and all kinds of things and we went exploring you know and we looked at just how magnificent just how magnificent everything there was we found an ant hill you know and we we watched the ants at work and how there was order to what they did and how how they went in and out of the little the little hole and into the ant hill and marveled at, at the order in God's universe. We looked at the different plants and how each plant seemed to be perfectly suited for its environment and the way that they grew, you know, and some had runners and they went out like vines and, and others had the little, um, we used to call them stickers when we were kids. I guess, I guess it was the origin of Velcro. There's these little things that just kind of attach to your clothes as you go by and the idea was, as animals would go by, these little things would stick to them, and then the seeds would get scattered. And we talked about just how perfect, just how perfect God's creation is, just how wonderful everything is, you know. And then, of course, could bring it back around to this little guy. And what about you, you know? And 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 your eyes that can see through this magnifying glass, and your hands and your feet, and you can walk, you know, and you can breathe and. What a beautiful day. And and it, the lesson turned into one of just being grateful. Just being grateful. Just having this attitude that everything is wonderful as it is. So we talked a little bit of gratitude is not this, this sticky feeling or, you know, of, of obsequious thank you. It's not that. It's this feeling of being immersed in the experience of the greatness of God. Not because we're so great, not an egotistical, oh, I am so great. But as Emerson says, get our bloated nothingness out of the way and just say, wow, how magnificent, how magnificent is God in its creation. Now, the other thing that comes up when we're looking at gratitude, is, and this typically comes up in prosperity classes, is people, um, and it's true, but we have to be careful there's a trap. People consider gratitude to be a causative energy, a causative energy. Right? That which we give our attention to, we get more of. That which we bless multiplies in our life. That which we curse diminishes and, and all those other sayings there's there's a law in the universe where it's done unto you according to your belief so if you where the trap is so let me let me back up a little bit so where the truth is is, is that that which we give our love and our attention to <clears throat> multiplies in our lives but the trap is 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 if i want something i have to i have to scrunch up some gratitude in order to bring it into my life. So this is kind of the uh, the teachings about tithing that, that personally I think a lot of them get, get distorted as they go, go through time. And the reason for it is, is people say, well, I need a thousand dollars. And the law of tithing says, if I give a hundred, I'll get a thousand back. So here's my hundred dollars. See, I'm priming the pump. I'm priming the pump with gratitude. I'm, I'm being grateful because I want to get something. This is this exchange of, I ask, you give, I'm thankful kind of view of gratitude. And and people do that, and as far as they believe that it will work for them, of course it works for them. But that is not gratitude. Gratitude is not something we try to develop this attitude of gratitude. We would try to develop this this feeling in order to get something. If If we are trying to do anything in order to get something we need to go back and look look at the motive then because that is not gratitude that is manipulation and that is trying to pull a lever in order to get something out of the slot machine so if we have been exposed to that idea we want to understand that yes in fact there is a power in the universe that responds to us according to our belief, the law of mind, the law by which prayer is answered. Right? New Testament says when you pray, pray believing that it is done and it shall be done. And shall is kind of a command. It shall be done. Thou shall. It's not like it might, it could. It shall be done. Consider it done. 
So we don't want to look at gratitude then as something that we, we have to remind ourselves, oh, I, 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 need to, I need to feel grateful because I want something out of it. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink of water. So the issues that we have there, what we need to consider in that, in that last model of gratitude and the first model of gratitude that I gave you, is that they are based on a belief in separation. The power is out there, the money is out there, the health is out there, the love is out there, the jobs are out there. Whatever it is that, whatever it is that I require for this experience of life is is out there somewhere. It is not a part of me. I am not a part of it. But it is out there somewhere. And I have to figure out how to make it come to me. I have to beg. I have to plead. I have to beseech. Or I have to, I have to work up into a frenzy, my desire, I have to work up into a frenzy, my gratitude. If you've ever read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, he talks about, he talks about whipping your desire up into a white hot heat, you know, to, uh, to create your desire for whatever it is into a white hot heat. That is a way of try, uh, trying to trying to manipulate, to try to, to try to make things come to us. It'll work, it'll work, but it's not gratitude. It's not gratitude. So what we want to come to then is, is we've talked about what gratitude is not. We've talked a little bit about, about this little guy with his pith helmet and his magnifying glass, just, just celebrating, just celebrating the goodness of life. And th that kind of gives us a better example of what I'm talking about with gratitude. So the way to really put it into perspective, the way to really get our bloated nothingness out of the way, is I ask you to consider, is God grateful? What does gratitude look like when viewed from God's point of view? And of course, it's a question we can't answer because this thing that we call God is beyond our intellectual capabilities. But the exercise helps us to take a different way of looking at things. <coughs> Excuse me. To bring ourselves around to, to the other side of the table, so to speak. To, to contemplate things from a different point of view. So, this thing that we call God, it already has everything. It already is everything. It already knows everything. It can do anything that it wants to do. That is kind of a point where the theologians of, of all different stripes might agree. Right? All-knowing, all-powerful, all-presence. So it doesn't have to try to manipulate to get something to come to it, nor does it, does it have anyone to thank, nor does it have to say, well, thank you. Who would it be thinking? What would it be thinking? So this human concept that I discussed of gratitude doesn't exist in the divine mind. Cannot exist in the divine mind. But what can exist in the divine mind, as, as far as we can guess, you know, is this feeling of joy. This feeling of celebration that I tried to describe with this little boy and his magnifying glass, you know. Just in awe at the, at the magnificence of God's creation. A couple years ago, um, one of our grandsons was over, I think he was about 12 at the time. And I had an old telescope, a little four-inch uh, four reflector telescope. And it had been sitting in a closet for years, it hadn't been used. And he was over, and uh, the moon was supposed to be, be uh, I'm sorry, 
Mars was supposed to be visible uh, below the moon that night. So <laughs> I went and got the box down, blew the dust off of it, set the telescope up, and went out there, found found Mars, and put it into the viewfinder for him. And when he put his eye down to the eyepiece, and he could see he could see the red planet in in that telescope, his his reaction was precious. It was just, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And we looked around, and I think we saw found Jupiter, and we, he was able to see the moons of Jupiter, you know. And he was just so excited, just so so in awe of discovering the goodness that was already there. It was almost like a celebration of the goodness that already existed. So what we can envision then when we, when we think about the divine mind and life itself, because it is one with everything, it is the very definition of love. And the joy, the joy that it experiences in seeing its creation, in experiencing its creation, see that joy, that's what I'm referring to as gratitude. It's not joy for a purpose. It's not, well, gee, if I act really joyful, something something even better will happen to me. It's just joy. It is just authentic joy. So what we want to come back to is instead of this, this idea of thinking that gratitude is something that I have to do or I ought to do or I should do, and if I do do it, it's a causative energy that causes other good things to happen to me. I invite you this year to, to move back beyond that idea and consider that gratitude, gratitude is God's celebration of its own creation through you, as you. Each of us has been created as a unique individualized expression of the divine. Excuse me. Each of us has been left alone to make that discovery. And in so doing, we develop this idea of separation. It's a, it's a normal idea to develop. In the Hindu teachings, they say, man has had ignorance heaped upon him. And then with a chuckle, they say, now, who did the heaping and why, you know, think about this. But we have been created and left alone so that we could rediscover, we could discover all of the magnificence of what God is as us and through us and in us and around us, but we could do it in a unique, individualized way. So now if we start to think of life and say that what's going on around us, what's going on through us, what's going on in us, is that God is living its life and discovering, discovering its creation anew through each and every one of us and celebrating itself through each and every one of us. And that is gratitude. That is a grateful attitude. That is a, a, a celebration attitude. Life is celebrating itself right where you are and right where I am. So rather than thinking this is something that I ought to do, I need to do, I should do, I, I have to do, I invite you to sit back and become an observer of just how magnificent God's work is. To, to think of your role in, in this life not as one of trying to get things, make things happen, have successful careers, all of those things that human beings tend to believe, which, which are all fine. But I invite you to move to a higher purpose this Thanksgiving and recognize yourself as an instrument of God's gratitude expressing 
through you. Of God's love experiencing itself as you. Of the unity of life rediscovering itself as it awakens from the dream of separation where you are. Joel Goldsmith tells us in the book of Genesis, we're told that God placed Adam into a deep sleep <clears throat> and took a rib and created Eve. But nowhere in the Bible are we told that Adam woke up. You and I, you and I, are this Adam. We are this human consciousness that is in the process of awakening to its spiritual truth. This is not a spiritual and a material universe. We are not beings that may one day become spiritual. We are spiritual beings here and now. As we look about us, as we breathe in the air, as we take in our food, let's do so with a great attitude, a grateful attitude, an attitude of awe, an attitude of celebration an attitude of recognizing just how wonderful God and God's work is. The thing, the thing that we need most in this physical experience is air. We can't go but a few minutes without air. And it is provided so beautifully for us so effortlessly <laughs> the trees the trees welcome our carbon dioxide and they give us back oxygen and there's a symbiotic relationship of life right there how magnificent is that we need water and it's provided in abundance and not only is it provided in abundance but the mechanism to draw it up from the seas, to distill it and purify it, to turn it into a cloud that can then blow over the land and drop the rain right where we need it, all of that was provided before you and I were born. How magnificent is that? We need food to eat. And by a miracle, by a miracle, the dust of the earth becomes the very food that our bodies need to eat. I am in awe of the simple, simple blade of grass. <clears throat> you know, of course, in the summertime, I'm not so much in awe because I got to get out there in 100 degree heat and mow it. But think about how magnificent the simple blade of grass is. It serves as, as feed for our livestock. It has mutated into rice and into corn and into wheat. And from this one simple plant, almost all of life on earth is sustained. How magnificent is that? So this year, as you go through Thanksgiving, what I would invite you to do is imagine yourself as, as Dr. Holmes called us, you know. <clears throat> Spiritual explorers, adventurers in the unexplored territory of mind. Put on your little spiritual pith helmet. Get out your little spiritual magnifying glass. Get your little butterfly net that you can use to to just capture something that inspires you about how magnificent God is. 
Take your little specimen jar so you can drop it in and take it home and sit in awe of it and then gently release it back into its environment. Divine love is celebrating life as each and every one of us. But we have to participate in that celebration. We have to choose. This year, this year, as we head into Thanksgiving, let's choose to have a great attitude, a grateful attitude, and to celebrate God's joy discovering itself through us and as us. And so it is.